Welcome to the sixth lecture on this course on computational fluid dynamics. Up until this lecture, we've examined the application of the finite difference method to problems that take place in solid materials. For example, we've looked at heat conduction at quite some length. In this first part of lecture six, we're going to examine how to incorporate fluid flow into the algebraic approximation to a transport equation. At first sight, it seems fairly straightforward, since all it appears to be is the incorporation of another derivative term and then a slight modification of the terms within the matrix M. What we'll actually see, though, is that there's a subtlety. There appears to be a hidden problem that we need to explain. We're going to introduce what that problem is, and in the next part of this lecture, we're going to explain why that problem exists. Now, convection is everywhere. I've put on the whiteboard here for you a photograph of a nice tropical beach at sunset, and you can see all those clouds brewing in the horizon. And if we look at nature, and especially at cloud forms, we find convection has a dominant role in a lot of the fluid mechanics of the planet. And we also see this within our own engineering world as well. And so if we think about chemical reactors, if we think about heat transport equipment, we will very often have a combination of both convection and diffusion taking place. Before we go any further, let's just clarify exactly what we mean in the context of transport equations about a convection diffusion problem. If we think of the structure of a transport equation, we'll remember that we've got a total derivative, partial d quantity by partial d time, and then we've got a v dot grad quantity. That v dot grad quantity, where the quantity could be, for example, temperature, is the convection term. This is the description of transport that happens due to a fluid flow having a velocity vector v. If we think of the diffusion terms, these are the terms we've been looking at already. It's the Laplacian term on the right-hand side of that transport equation. It could be a pre-multiplier del squared t, or a pre-multiplier del squared c for concentration. And so within convection diffusion problems, we have got two physical mechanisms for the conveyance of our quantity. We've got the fluid flow, and we've got a molecular means. We've got a diffusive-based process. Now, if we think about that velocity field, we'll typically have one of two situations. We will either know exactly what that velocity field is. We call this knowing the velocity field a priori. We might have a very simple geometry. We might have a pipe or a slot, and we might have laminar flow, and we might have a Newtonian fluid. And we'll say, fine, our velocity profile is parabolic with this particular algebraic description. In which case, fine, all we need to do is incorporate that velocity within our transport equation and think about how to solve our transport equation. When we're thinking of the more typical engineering geometries that we'll be simulating and solving problems for, the fluid flow will be part of the problem we're also trying to solve. And so what we find is we now have a more complex problem and we have to solve, for example, the Navier-Stokes equations in parallel with our energy transport equation or our mass transport equation or our phase transport equation. And this is a more computationally expensive exercise. And whether you do that solution of Navier-Stokes and mass or energy or phase transport simultaneously or sequentially is a matter for the problem that's actually being solved. For the point of illustrating what I want to try and get across in this lecture, we're going to assume that we know what the velocity field is within our geometries. We know it a priori, and we'll just specify it and then look how that affects the transport equation. So, we need to handle this velocity field very, very carefully. If we handle this velocity field in a naive sense, what we'll see is it actually causes major problems to the numerical solution of our transport equation. And sometimes these numerical problems don't show up in a particularly obvious manner. So I'm going to introduce the example with which we're going to illustrate the point. Here on the whiteboard is a sketch of a problem. It's a fluid flow problem. So effectively what we have is a geometry with cold fluid entering on the left hand side at 20 degrees C. We have some hot walls and the temperature of these walls is 50 degrees C so the fluid starts to heat up. And then in the second part of our solution domain, we have perfect insulation. And so whatever heat has been gained by the fluid just gets kept through this section. At the right hand end, we have a constant temperature gradient. And this might be starting to approximate an outflow boundary condition, especially if in the x direction, our temperature gradient equals zero. 
and if we think about it, if our insulation is nice and long, there shouldn't be any change of temperature, and so dt by dx should equal zero at the right-hand side of this geometry, which corresponds to a typical outflow boundary condition. So, if we remember how we set about doing these problems, we make a sketch of our solution domain, and then we simplify it, and we'll write down our simplifying assumptions. So, our simplifying assumptions are going to be, firstly, that the problem is transient, so we have time dependency in the problem. So we would expect there to be an initial value of temperature through the solution domain. And then as time steps on, the fluid will heat up as a result of heat conduction inwards. The second assumption we're going to make is that heat transport occurs in a liquid now, not a solid. We're going to make a very big simplifying assumption for our velocity field. We'll see in a minute that our solution domain is going to be assumed to be in Cartesian coordinates. So it's an infinitely wide, narrow slot. For the purposes of illustrating the points that I want to make, I'm going to assume that the velocity profile within that slot is actually plug flow. We know, of course, if it was laminar flow and if it was a Newtonian fluid, you would have a parabolic velocity profile. But that just adds an extra layer of complication to illustrating what I want to illustrate. So we're going to assume, nice and simply, that we've just simply got a superficial velocity, Vx, and we can assume that this velocity profile is indeed plug flow in nature. Now, if we concentrate on the conduction terms on the first part of this geometry, what we're going to do within our transport equation is approximate this as a heat source. And we'll see exactly how we do that in a minute and exactly what care we need to take when we do that. We've already mentioned that we're using a Cartesian coordinate system. And the important ramification from this is that we're going to say we're going to look at only a one dimensional problem. Now the plug flow velocity makes a bit more sense because we haven't got a 2D problem in which to resolve a velocity field. The only gradients are going to exist in the flow direction, which is the x direction. We're going to furthermore assume that all our material properties here are isotropic, which is that means they're the same in all directions. So we haven't got a microstructured fluid or anything complex like that. Again, it wouldn't serve to help us illustrating the point that I want to make. If we think about the insulation in the second part of the flow domain, we're going to assume that it is perfect. So there's no, neither heat loss nor heat gain in this area. Finally, what we're going to do is we're going to time step the problem. And what we're going to do then is just keep time stepping until a steady state solution is reached. So here are our assumptions. There's our flow domain. The next important thing we need to do is to sit and think. We need to construct, in our mind's eye, our own mental model for what's happening here. If we do this relatively well, we can then look at the solution the computer calculates and go, yes, I agree with that, or, hmm, I think there's something wrong with that. And the ability to be able to say, hmm, I think there's something wrong with that, is one of the main reasons why we have to think carefully about our problem before we start solving it. So, we've got a fluid flow problem with heat transfer. The fluid is initially cold, it's 20 degrees C and it warms up, but we've said that we're going to iterate this problem or time step this problem until the steady state is reached. So presumably when we look at the solution that the computer calculates, we'll just look at that steady state solution. So let's make our mental model a steady state solution. We can see from the diagram that we've got fluid coming in at 20 degrees C we can see that there is heat transfer from hot walls at 50 degrees C, so we would expect that fluid to heat up. Let's think how we expect that fluid to heat up. In a short space that is of length L1, I wouldn't expect the fluid to reach 50 degrees C. If we think about it more generally, we'd never expect the fluid to reach 50 degrees C, even if this was an infinitely long domain, because the temperature driving force would become less and less and less and less for heat transfer, as the fluid got hotter and hotter and hotter. And so what you get is an asymptotic kind of relationship with the fluid asymptoting to a temperature that is, for all practical engineering purposes, kind of 50 degrees C, but from a scientific standpoint, it would never be exactly 50 degrees C. So we'd expect our fluid to heat up, and bearing in mind that our heat transfer is governed by a temperature driving force, and that temperature driving force gets less and less the hotter the fluid gets, perhaps we would expect 
the way in which the fluid to heat up over this short section to be non-linear with respect to distance. If we think of the second section, we've said that there is perfect insulation, and so there should be neither heat loss nor heat gain here, and so we would expect the temperature of the fluid to remain constant through that section, constant at whatever temperature it had reached in the heat transfer section. So there's our mental model. We'll file that away to one side and we'll use it when we come to look at the solution that the computer calculates for us. Now, the next thing, of course, is to apply those simplifications to the energy transport equation. Now, remember what I said about the importance of being comfortable with dealing with transport equations in vector form. It allows very quick and very easy simplification before we have to worry about the complication of what the coordinate system does to our transport equation. So here on the whiteboard, I've written in the energy transport equation in vector form. I've expanded out the total derivative on the left-hand side, and that reminds us that we've got two terms there, a partial time derivative and our convection term, our v dot grad t term. On the right-hand side of the equation, we can see we've got our Laplacian diffusion term, so that's heat conduction, and then we've got our heat source term involving our source quantity, Ra. OK, so the first thing that we're going to do is to recognise what form that heat source takes. Now, we've got to do this a little bit carefully. We've got Ra over rho Cp. Now, if we were to rearrange the first line of that equation, and if we had it all multiplied through by rho Cp, so Ra stood on its own on the right-hand side, we would look at rho Cp dt by dt, and we'd say that density, mass density, has kilos per cubic metre. Cp is joules per kilo Kelvin. dt by dt is Kelvin per second. And so when you multiply that lot together, you end up with joules per second per metre cube. Watts per metre cube. So our RA term, our energy source term, is a volumetric rate of energy transport. It's joules per second per metre cubed. And we need to bear that in mind when we specify a value for RA. Now, joules per second per metre cubed. If we look at a typical heat transport by natural convection type expression, it's a heat transfer coefficient H multiplied by an area A, times a temperature driving force. And that is indeed the numerator on that blue term, H A T minus T infinity, where T infinity in this case is the wall temperature. If we were to do some dimensional analysis on that term and compare it to watts per cubic metre, which we know RA has to take, we'll find that it wouldn't be correct, would it? Because if we think about H, it's watts per metre squared Kelvin times A metre squared times the temperature difference Kelvin, RA in that case would just be watts. So this underlines an important point. Don't forget your dimensional analysis because it can prevent you from falling into a trap here. What we need for RA is a volumetric energy source term. And so I'm going to normalise HA T minus T infinity by volume V, such that I end up with the correct dimensions of that term. And of course, if the dimensions there are incorrect, the entire equation is itself incorrect. So careful treatment of the heat source term is needed, remembering that Ra is a volumetric rate of energy gain. Now, since we've simplified our transport equation into its simplest form vectorially, we're now going to drop it into our Cartesian coordinate system. And we're going to remember that we're just dealing with one dimension, the x dimension only. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the terms in purple, which were the velocity field terms, and put them on the right-hand side of the equation and just simply pose this transport equation as partial the temperature by partial the time. So the convection terms. If we think about what our velocity field is, V, we've said that it's plug flow. We just have an x direction velocity, no y direction, no z direction. So our velocity vector is going to be Vx, 0, 0. Grad T. We've said that the only temperature gradients exist in the x direction. So dt by dy and dt by dz equals zero. So the only gradient that exists is dt by dx. So grad t as a vector will be written dt by dx, zero, zero. So if we take the dot product of the velocity field and the temperature gradient vector, we've got 
effectively vx dt by dx as the only non-zero term that we have, which is that term written in purple there, the first term on the right-hand side. If we think about our diffusion term, Laplacian, del squared t, we've only got gradients in the x direction, and so the only term that exists is d2t by dx squared. If we examine what I've done to that diffusion term, I've just said, well, look, area and volume both scale with the same dimension, which is going to be a characteristic length scale, which I'm calling d. So if we think about area and we think about volume, we've got effectively a 4 over d type relationship if we end up with this Cartesian geometry. So here is my simplified transport equation. It consists of convective energy transport, diffusive energy transport, and heat source terms, all contributing to our rate of temperature gain, dt by dt. So the next thing to do is to drop this into algebraic terms. And we're going to first of all examine spatial discretization of this partial differential equation. Now, we can see when we write the transport equation up, we've got two terms that involve spatial gradients, dt by dx and d2t by dx squared. Now, what we'd like to do, of course, is to solve this in the most accurate way possible. So, if we look at the options that we have for our gradient terms, we remember we've got forward differences, backward differences, and central differences. And in a previous lecture, we've said that, look, forward differences and backward differences are first order accurate. Try not to use them because they're inaccurate. Central differences are second order and are a good starting point. So, all right. What we'll do is we'll choose central differencing for our spatial discretization. And here we have those central differencing put into my first derivative, my convection terms there in purple, ti plus 1 minus ti minus 1 over 2 delta x. And also my central differencing put into my conduction terms, which of course is that second differential, ti plus 1 minus 2ti plus ti minus 1 over delta x squared. So that is a discrete form of my energy transport equation, simplified for the problem at hand. So we're going to rearrange this and we're going to rearrange it in such a form that we've got all the temperature terms multiplied by a set of factors because if you remember the vector matrix equation that we form is a matrix M multiplied by a temperature vector plus typically a boundary condition vector equaling in this case my time gradient. And when I write the terms in this way, we can quite easily see what we expect the structure of that matrix to be, because we've got three terms from the temperature vector, and so therefore the matrix must have a sufficient structure to operate on those three terms, which means it's going to be tridiagonal. Okay, so we have our vector matrix equation, d temperature vector by d time, as an ordinary differential equation now, as equal to a set of algebraic equations on the right-hand side, which is mt plus b, where m is our nice triagonal matrix. So we might elect to solve the left-hand side, our temporal discretization, by using something like a fourth-order runger cutter time stepper. And in terms of the matrix inversion problem that we need to solve, we would probably use something like the tridiagonal matrix algorithm, because we can see that we've got a tridiagonal matrix, and we know that the tridiagonal matrix algorithm will operate using order m um, calculations for an m by m matrix. So that's ideal for what we need. We don't need any indirect matrix inversion method. Now, we're going to look at two solutions to this problem at two different Peclet numbers. It's very useful to think about the non-dimensional group, the Peclet number in this case, because the Peclet number is the ratio of energy transfer by convection versus energy transfer by diffusion or conduction. And so small Peclet numbers, we have a conduction dominated problem. Large Peclet numbers, we have a convection dominated problem, which of course are the two physical mechanisms that we have in our transport equation. So looking at small Peclet numbers and large Peclet numbers, in effect, shifts the focus of where the physical mechanism lies for our matter transport. So here's a reminder of our solution domain. Remember that we had our mental model. We formed our mental model saying that we should have a nonlinear increase in temperature from 20 degrees C to less than 50 degrees C, and then a set of space where our temperature is constant.
So if we code up the problem and plot temperature out, we can obtain the following graph at small Peclé number. This is where convection is weak compared to conduction. And we can see that the numerical solution allies almost exactly with our mental model. We have that nonlinear increase in temperature, and then we have a constant temperature. And if we look at the value of that temperature, it's computed to be 38 degrees. And from an engineering standpoint, my intuition is telling me that feels about right. Now, what happens if we increase our fluid flow and if we make convection a stronger part of the transport mechanism? Let's look at a second solution for strong to convection where the Peclet number is much greater than one, we see something interesting happening. The bit I've highlighted in red there seems to be some kind of temperature oscillation. What's going on? This now doesn't correspond to my mental model. Now, I'm pretty confident my mental model is correct, which means what's wrong with what we've just done? We're going to explore that in the second part of this lecture. So, a few key points. Convection and convection diffusion problems are very, very common. We're looking at a specific energy transport convection diffusion problem, and we've taken it and we've simplified it, and we've looked at two solutions to this problem, and we've seen that one solution seems reasonable, a small Peclet number, where conduction dominates convection, but we've also seen that something very odd is happening for the inverse case, where convection dominates conduction. And so what we need to do is to investigate this.